I don't say this to boast, and in fact, I often don't even talk about this aspect of my testimony because I don't believe in magnifying demonic power. In fact, I believe in the church today that one of the bigger issues is not so much demonic oppression, rather it's demonic obsession. And sometimes we take on doctrines and theologies that so magnify the power of the enemy that we minimize the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want to remind you, no matter what spirit is coming against you, there is no spirit more powerful than the Holy Spirit. And we have to stop talking as if we serve a little God and we're facing a big devil. Church, the scripture declares that when you resist the devil, he will flee from you. The Bible doesn't say that if you resist the devil, he fights. It says you resist the devil and he will flee. That means he runs. Why? Because he recognizes that you finally know who you are. We have Christians bragging. Bragging about their bondage. Well, the Lord knows that the reason the enemy attacks me so much is because he knows how anointed and appointed and great I am. He can see my destiny. No, my friend, the reason that he can keep you in bondage is because he knows that you've already surrendered that area. Oh, I can hear a groan. I know we're just on the right vein here. And we magnify the power of the enemy. But I'm not sharing this to magnify the power of the enemy. I want to share with you just how dark things were so that you can understand just how marvelous that light of the Holy Spirit truly is. So my great-great-grandfather was a warlock from Zacatecas, Mexico. He was also a politician, very wealthy, and people would come from all over the... My nanny's going to correct me if I get one thing wrong. Please do. He would, he would come, the people would come from all over the world and he would place curses on people. And they would also bring him the sick that he might heal them. But of course, he used demonic power. There was a report, and we weren't able to verify this, but there was a report from people in the area who said that he was able to call down fire from the sky. Now, this was great demonic power, but again, I'm not saying that to brag. I'm not saying that to magnify the power of the enemy. We recognize that we are in a spiritual battle and that demonic power is real. So that's a part of the story. Now... People ask me often, David, do you believe in generational curses? I believe that the enemy will strategize against families generationally. And as he strategizes against families generationally, he recognizes what temptations work for that family. And because of genetics, because of tendencies, because of social constructs and the way that these individuals are raised from generation to generation, what worked on the father will work on the son. What worked on the mother will work on the daughter. This is why you'll see generations of alcoholism, generations of drug addiction, generations of adultery. Why? Because the enemy knows that if it worked on the previous generation, it will likely work on this generation. But we have to get this picture out of our mind of a demon waiting in the corner of a delivery room to jump onto the child. And that as soon as the baby's born, it jumps on that child and now it has it and there's nothing that can be done unless they solve some riddle. So I believe in what's called generational attack. And if we respond to the attack of the enemy with disobedience toward God, then we have what's called generational consequence. You see, I don't like to use the term generational curse because the term generational curse implies that there's nothing I can do in my power to break it. But when you recognize that it's generational consequence, then you begin to see that the choices you make determine how much the enemy can get away with in your life. When you say generational curse, you blame your parents for your bondage. And that's not biblical. Guys, it's not biblical. You point to the Old Testament scripture where the Bible talks about that generation being visited upon generation with that wrath and with that curse. What's actually being talked about there is a nation that's experiencing captivity from the surrounding nations such as Babylon. And when that nation was disobedient toward God, they would go into slavery and therefore their children would be born into slavery. It's not saying that if your parents sin that God's going to hold you accountable for that. Nothing in the scripture like that. In fact, it says just the opposite. And so once you begin to recognize that it's generational consequence 
and not generational curse, you realize that the choices you make determine whether or not you're going to walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh. The enemy will tempt you from generation to generation, yes. The enemy will attack you from generation to generation, yes. But you do not have to walk in the same bondage that your parents walked in if you begin to follow Jesus. It's like we imagine that we have to solve some riddle like in some scary movie where the demonic power can't be broken unless they go far back in enough generations or read in some ancient book some code that finally breaks the power of the enemy. My friend, you don't need an Ancestry.com to be free. You don't need to go to the History Channel and find out about your family. You don't need to go through documents and layers and layers of genealogies in order to find your freedom. The scripture declares where the Spirit of the Lord is there is liberty people say brother David what about the bloodline what about the bloodline my family bloodline my friend what about the blood of Jesus that breaks every curse so don't hear what I'm not saying I'm not denying that the enemy attacks generationally I'm saying that the way we think about those attacks have to change have to change and we have to align with what the scripture says but what's happened in the church is that we've taken teachings from the occult, we've taken teachings from new age practices, we reverse engineer them, and then we call it deliverance doctrine. We reverse engineer what the enemy says is true, and then we try to apply it to a scriptural framework. My friend, when you get saved and you come out of the occult, when you get saved and you come out of new age, you don't take all the teachings from the occult and you don't take all the teachings from the new age. You take just scripture. And then you look at what the Bible says about the, this is why there's so much confusion in this area. And this is why so many remain perpetually bound going from deliverance to deliverance when they should be going from glory to glory. Now again, this sounds a little bit different possibly than what you've been told, and I'm telling you this, it doesn't necessarily contradict what we've been taught, but we have to change the way we think about the power of the enemy. Power of the enemy is real, yes, he attacks generationally, yes, there are consequences to sin, yes, we can open doors, and by that I mean we can cause areas in our lives to come under the influence of demonic attack, and we can make ourselves susceptible to, de to deception by the way we live. But we have to take what the scripture says and adjust what we think about the spiritual realm based on the scripture and the scripture alone. The moment you begin to reach outside the scripture, now you're beginning to take from other belief systems. Why would you take anything from a belief system that was founded upon demonic deception? Why would you take anything from the occult? Why would you take anything from new age? Reject it and follow the way of scripture. Now I say that because our family wrestled with this. Demonic attack like you wouldn't believe. My friend, I literally saw demonic beings in my room when I was a boy. You want to talk about demonic attack? I saw them. Not in a person there in manifested form in my room. I would hear them whisper. There was one instance where I, at 3 o'clock in the morning, turned over from my sleep and I saw sitting on a couch three old ladies and they were looking at me and whispering to each other about me I would see demonic manifestations faces in the wall now of course my grandparents were Christians my parents were Christians but this doesn't mean the enemy won't try to attack your family now, whenever they would rebuke that power, it would break. In fact, my parents rebuked it. They prayed with me. There was an instance where I was insisting that my dad, when he was making church flyers, I insisted that he handed a flyer to the man that was standing in the corner, who I would often converse with. And I can still see him in my head right now. And I will not describe him, but he was just, it wasn't, it wasn't an imaginary friend. It, this was someone I truly thought was there. I would converse with this person often.
but it's a demonic entity. And so once they realized what was happening, they prayed, and it stopped that level of demonic attack, yes, but it didn't stop what was happening in me because I'd yet to receive Christ. And so from the ages 7 to 11, the attacks of demonic power began to intensify. I suffered severely with depression and anxiety. And you ask my grandparents, this was generational. This was a generational attack, a strategy used against us. And so because I had yet to receive the Lord, this began to get worse and worse. Until one week, my family went to a Bible conference. Now, if you're a pastor's kid, you understand that sometimes the family vacation doubles as the Bible conference, and the Bible conference doubles as the family vacation. So this was Bible conference slash family vacation. And I remember standing in the back of the room as the people began to worship, and I became upset, like angry. And I'm watching the people worship, and I'm thinking, God, I want to be free like that. Why is my mind so tormented? It was, it was hellish. It was intense. But what the enemy meant for evil, God turned around for good. Because this attack pushed me toward Jesus. Now here's something else I want to say, and I want to be very careful. A lot of what I say, I'm asking that you listen carefully, because it can be very nuanced. And, and, and I don't say that to boast. I say that because I want to be very careful with how I describe these things. Um, just like I mentioned a moment ago about curses and spiritual warfare. Yes, different than what you've been told, but not necessarily contradictory. It's a challenge to think through biblical framework instead of through what we've been told. And so I'm standing there in the back of the room, and I'm upset. I'm upset that these people are worshiping and rejoicing. And that attack intensified to the point where I got desperate. Now, here's what I was going to say when I told you, please don't hear what I'm not saying. Desperation has its place. Desperation can serve good purposes. But while desperation is a great initiator, it is not a great lifestyle. Let me explain. Because what some of you might have heard me say was, are you saying we shouldn't be hungry for God? No. Hungry for God is one thing. Desperate for God means you haven't been in touch with him. Desperate means I lack. Desperate means I'm without. Desperate means I'm in trouble. Now, will you face trial and tragedy and trouble? Of course. Will you still find some desperate situations? Absolutely. But the believer cannot be desperate for what he already has. Hungry for God, yes. The difference between hunger and starvation. If I'm hungry for something, it's because I've been eating. I had breakfast, lunch, dinner, hopefully, and the next day I'm hungry again. But if I'm starving, it means I haven't eaten in a long time. That's the difference between hunger and desperation. So we get that confused. Hunger, yes, I'm hungry for you in worship. I desire you in worship. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. We long for him, we desire him, but we are not desperate in the sense that we lack him. Now, at that point, I was desperate. And that's why I say that desperate moments can push you into encounters with God. But that doesn't mean you stay in desperation because you have to begin to get things in order. And so I began to just wrestle with the Holy Spirit. You ever try that? It's a losing battle. <laughs> and I know that I need to go talk to my dad and tell him that I need to get saved. Now, I knew Jesus historically. I could have told you all the stories about him. I knew Jesus philosophically. I could have told you all of his teachings. In fact, as a child... I was taught to memorize the scripture. I went to a Baptist school. So a charismatic in a Baptist school. And there you have my life story pretty much. <laughs> and so I, I had to memorize large portions of scripture. I knew Jesus, of course, with his philosophy, his teachings. That was a part of me. 
was a moral code, a nice decoration that I wore, part of my culture and identity. And I knew Jesus socially because my family knew him. But I did not know Jesus personally. And here's the thing. This is why it's so difficult for religious people to have encounters with God. Because in order to embrace the genuine, you have to admit that what you had wasn't real. And ego will keep you from doing that. What I had was superficial. What I had was intellectual. But it was not true and deep and a part of who I was. And so I call my dad into the room. I said, Dad, I want to get saved. I need Jesus. I, I've, not, I've never been saved. I need to be born again. And so we sit down in the hotel room. Now, if you've ever been in a hotel, you know some rooms have double beds. There were two beds. On one bed, my father sat facing the other bed. On the other bed, I sat facing my father. He reached his hands out. I grabbed his hands. and He began to pray with me, what many would refer to as the sinner's prayer. Now, of course, in the scripture, we understand that there's no such thing as the sinner's prayer. But I promise you, in the scripture, you'll find sinners who pray. <laughs> the Bible talks about confession being an important component of the salvation experience. So yes, that's biblical. Now, that doesn't mean you say a magic word and then all of a sudden you're saved. There has to be something genuine happening there. And so he begins to lead me in prayer. And I remember that I began to sense the love of God come over me. And as he's leading me in this prayer, I'm trying to say the words. And, and as I'm praying, my mouth is shaking. I'm crying so much. Tears are streaming down my face. I couldn't even get the words out. I was sobbing. But in my mind and in my heart, I'm declaring. and I'm calling out to Jesus to save me, to rescue me. My friend, as he began to lead me in that prayer, and as I began to surrender my heart, I began to feel the love of God envelop me. I began to feel the peace of God calm me. I began to feel the joy of the Spirit well up from inside of me. And the moment that Jesus walked in, every demon ran out. Instant peace. Instant deliverance. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I experienced that touch of God on my life began to walk with him, to know him. And for the first time ever, I knew in my heart, I met Jesus. And, and we say that, and it can become cliche. But no, my friend, I met Jesus, the son of the living God, the same who walked the shores of Galilee, the great I am, the one who walked with the disciples, Jesus, I met him. And I know him now. I know Jesus. What a joy. From that moment on, something began to transform in my heart. There was a boldness that began to rise. There was this hunger, this spiritual vitality, the breath of God, this breath of life, the wind of the Spirit, if you will, that began to carry me. And after this experience with meeting Jesus... I began to desire to know this person they call the Holy Spirit. Now let me be clear, Romans 8, 9 makes it very, very, very clear that the moment you are born again, you have the Holy Spirit. So what then is to be said of this experience that we see, for example, in Acts 2 and Acts 4, where spirit-filled believers seem to receive again the Holy Spirit? I like to use an analogy that helps to encapsulate the teachings of Scripture, and that would be to say that the Holy Spirit, or the experience of His presence, is both a well and a river. It's both an experience and a continual state of being. At salvation, the Holy Spirit fills you like water in a cup. But for the rest of your life, the Holy Spirit will fill you like wind in a sail. This continual 
infilling. Ephesians 5.18, this continual empowerment. Be filled. It's a continuation of that which you experience. So the question isn't, do I have the Holy Spirit? The question should be, does the Holy Spirit have me? At salvation, you receive him for the rest of your life. You surrender to him. And I wanted this friendship with the Holy Spirit that so many had talked about. I heard stories of preachers who would pray for hours. And I would wonder, what are you talking about for hours? I really, it, was, it wasn't like a cynical wondering. I genuinely wanted to know, what do you talk to God about for hours at a time? I had heard of other people's encounters in his presence. And I longed for that too. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. This oneness with God, this connection with the Holy Spirit, this having him as a friend for everyday living. So, determined to encounter the Holy Spirit, I gave God somewhat of an ultimatum. I don't recommend you do this. Let me say this very clearly. This is my testimony. This is not doctrine to follow, okay? I shut the door in my room. Right there at Nani Papi, at Twin Palms apartment. That room that, ha- that wasn't really a room but had to be closed off. That room. I shut the door. And I said to the Lord, I'm not leaving here until I have an encounter with you. I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to sleep. Not until I experience the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. So... I embark on this spiritual journey. I begin to pray and pray and pray. And I'm thinking, man, I must have been praying now for several hours. I look at the clock and 10 minutes have passed. (laughs) So that first hour I'm praying, just standard prayers, talking to the Lord. I set up my room just so. My ceiling light was on. The ceiling fan was on so that the room could stay comfortable. My Bible was open. This was before Instagram. My Bible was open, picture perfect. I had music playing in the background, and I was ready. I had set the mood. I was ready to encounter God. (laughs) One hour went by. I became a little discouraged because nothing happened. You You ever get those situations where you hear of other people's encounters And then you go expecting the same and it doesn't happen for you. Do you know why sometimes that is? Because an intense desire for an encounter with God or an experience, a spiritual experience, can sometimes itself become a distraction from God himself. You're so worried about what you feel or don't feel. You're so worried about what you're experiencing or not experiencing And you're waiting for your feelings and emotions to confirm what you should already believe from Scripture. If you were to ask me in that moment, is God near to you? I would have said no. Because most believers live their lives imagining that God is a million miles away, not recognizing that he's in you. Not about you getting more of the Holy Spirit. It's about the Holy Spirit getting more of you. That comes by way of surrender. First hour went by nothing. Second hour, I begin to pray. Now, I begin to pray spiritual warfare prayers. And I begin to rebuke the spirit of this, the spirit of that. The spirit of I can't pray because I'm distracted. I cast you out in Jesus' name. I'm pointing at corners and talking to imaginary beings. And if there was an adjective, I attached it to a demon and then rebuked it. (laughs) Yes, spiritual warfare is real. Yes, we sometimes wrestle against demonic powers. Yes, we ought to rebuke demonic beings. Yes, we ought to practice deliverance and exorcism. That's for today. And if you don't believe that, then you got to read the scripture. That wasn't what I was facing. You see, I thought I was fighting a demon at that time. I didn't realize I was actually fighting the flesh. You see, you can cast the demon out, but you can't cast you out of you. 
The flesh doesn't come and go. The flesh shrinks and grows depending upon how you live your life. And I was so in the flesh, I was relying upon my own strength. That second hour goes by. Finally, the third one comes. And now I begin to become a theologian. All of the prayer techniques I had learned, all of the prayer books I had read, everything I knew about prayer, I began to apply. And an hour goes by, and wouldn't you believe it, nothing happened. It was at this point I really began to regret that ultimatum that I made before God. I was like, Lord, would you mind if I just took a nap? But I persisted. And then I reached for emotion. And I tried to manipulate God by way of using guilt into responding to me. God, can't you see me? God, don't you hear me? And we do it all the time, church. I read it in the comments section. I just know God's not going to do it for me. He always ignores me. <laughs> and we think that God responds to emotions when actually he responds to faith and trust. You see, first... 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 talks about the body, the soul, and the spirit. Now, as you begin to study the scripture, you'll see that at least for the believer, the soul and the spirit aren't necessarily perfectly divided with a bold and distinct line like we've sometimes imagined. I have those illustrations in my books. I think thinking about the human experience in compartments like that can be helpful for understanding certain doctrines. But really, the soul and the spirit are somewhat blended. It's more of a gradient than it is a bold line between the two. Especially if you read in the Old Testament about these concepts, you'll begin to see that there's more of a tie together than there is a separation. And Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 38, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And of course, we know because the scripture plainly tells us that he was talking about the Holy Spirit. So body, soul, spirit, out of my innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Now, I really want to challenge you here with this. Because that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to see. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. If You begin prayer from the flesh, you're praying in the flesh. And many of us begin prayer and worship from the exterior instead of beginning from the spirit. David, what do you mean by that? When we go to pray, do I sit? Do I stand? Can I pace? Am I able to lie down? Do you want me on my face? Is it disrespectful if I sit? Do I have to pray out loud? Do I yell? Do I whisper? Can I think my own thoughts? When do I pray in tongues? And by the way, can I think in tongues? Is that even biblical? (laughs) And we begin to try to connect with God from the exterior. Now again, don't hear what I'm not saying. When the Holy Spirit inspires you, it is true that sometimes from the Spirit will be inspired worship that causes you to shout and causes you to dance, and causes you to sing, and causes you to jump. I don't care if you do cartwheels. If it comes from the Spirit, it's worship. And it's a beautiful thing to see. However, if you are trying to connect with God because of those things, you missed it. This is why you can sing, and you can dance, and you can even do good charity work. But the moment you begin to pray, your flesh starts to squirm. Why? Because prayer is the death of the flesh. And so now, we sometimes pray from the outside. We think we'll be heard because we yell. We think we'll be heard because we cry. Now again, you can yell and you can cry if it begins from within. But we do not pray to connect with God. We pray from connection with God. And that is the primary difference between praying in the flesh and praying in the spirit. And so we try to to make up for something that we think we're lacking. Like when you get a bad call and the call starts to drop. 
and the other person on the other end, when you tell them that the call is dropping, they start to scream at you. But the issue is not the volume, it's the connection. And many times we try to make up for, with emotional and physical volume, what we don't recognize as spiritual connection. And we pray from the exterior. We shout to connect when we should, connect, when we should shout because we're connected. And then we try to reach for emotions, which is what I was doing. Lord, don't you hear me? God, can't you see me? My friend, I cried every tear I could cry. My carpet was wet with tears. My physical body was tense because I so wanted an encounter with God. I wanted to experience what others had talked about. Still, even after the fourth hour, nothing happened. And I became discouraged. Now, let me tell you what I did. My friend... I finally gave up. But not in the way you might think. I was empty of myself. It took me four hours, but I finally got the flesh to be subjected. Because at that point, my flesh was very strong. Four hours of fighting this thing. Exhausted of emotion. Exhausted of willpower, exhausted of my own desire, exhausted of physical strength. That's when the Holy Ghost showed up. I was done. Now, that's the hard way. The easier way is to just believe that you're already connected with him. That's, the easy, that's why I often tell people, imagine how much heartache and time you would save in prayer if instead of begging God to hear you, you simply believe that he already did. And so I was, I was empty. I lifted my hands. And now real tears began to flow. And I said, Lord, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to find Jesus. Please help me find Jesus. And the Holy Spirit began to speak. He told me to turn off the fan. It was distracting. Turn off the light. For now, close the scripture. A little uncomfortable with that. But you see, I had already read like 30 or 40 chapters of the Bible that day. And I did so, and I'm going to say something. It's going to sound like I'm joking, but I'm being serious. I had what I've, I've coined this phrase, and I call it a religious OCD, where you're obsessively compulsive over certain acts, and you read the Bible not because you want to know him, but because you fear that you didn't do your duty if you didn't read enough that day. You pray for hours, not because you love him, but because you're afraid that you're going to be judged because you didn't pray enough hours that day. That's not of the spirit. That's where I came from. So, for now, close the scripture. And then he said, turn off the music. And this was my genuine response. But you can't move without the music. <laughs> That's how programmed I was. After a slight hesitation, I just obeyed. And then I closed my eyes and I just trusted him. I didn't try to conjure. See, we, especially we as charismatics, and I'm a charismatic, we as charismatics, we think we have to conjure things. Conjure an atmosphere, conjure a connection, conjure a miracle. My friend, just rest in what he's done. See, see, that's the difference for these meetings. You want to know why the power of the Holy Ghost shows up so strong in these meetings? It's because people are led with truth to just yield to the Spirit and let him do it. Instead of fighting, fighting, fighting. And I closed my eyes. 
And the presence of the Holy Spirit filled my room. It was as though the plain and mediocre settings of my bedroom had been lifted to a heavenly realm. And I didn't work for it. (laughs) I didn't work for it. And he wanted me to know that I couldn't work for it. When you've got nothing left, you've given all that you can give, that's when God shows up because he wants you to know who deserves the credit for it. And so, I'm standing there. The presence of the Holy Spirit fills my being. I began to feel pulses of electric currents move up and down my body. Heat enveloped me. A weight filled the room. And I remember I felt as though I was standing in a wave of water. And I felt the love of God fill my heart. Peace. Joy. It was euphoric. This joy just, it was like an explosion from my spirit. Just joy. And it billowed out over me. And I didn't want to move in that moment because I felt as though if I moved, I might feel my hand brush up against his robe. That's how real the presence of Jesus had become. I didn't want to open my eyes because I was certain if I opened my eyes, I would see Jesus staring right back at me. And I didn't want to be startled and break that. What I sensed in that moment lasted for just a couple of minutes. But had I sought it for a hundred years, it would have been worth every second. And that marked my life. As a result, boldness came upon me. A ministry was birthed, not out of ministry politics and clever marketing, but out of an encounter with Jesus, a ministry was birthed. I began to pray for the sick at my school. Miracles were happening in the school. I recall one such instance where a kid was being healed of psoriasis. People of God, we watched as the skin disease disappeared from his arm. And, and there, was, there was a skeptic watching. He's watching us like this with his arms folded. And he's telling the, his friends something to the effect of this is all in their heads. It's all fake. And when I turned to explain to him that it's the real deal, I felt a jolt of electricity jump out of my hand. He hits the floor on a pile of bricks. He gets up off the floor, shaking his head going, this isn't real, this isn't real, this isn't real, this isn't real, this isn't real. real." That Thursday, he was in church giving his heart to Jesus. The power of God began to move. It overflowed my life. I began to see miracles and salvations. There was a new way of thinking that had began to clarify things for me. And I no longer looked at God as this angry person in the sky who wanted nothing to do with me. I knew that he was my father. I knew that he was for me. I knew that he loved me. There was a joy overflowing and it began to impact people around me. And God took it from there. Zechariah 12.10, we see that the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. John 14.26, we see that the Holy Spirit helps to teach us the truth. Galatians 5.16 shows us that the Holy Spirit is our power unto holiness. Some of you are so afraid of losing the Holy Spirit for every mistake that you make. But I promise you, God would not remove from you your only chance for being holy as a punishment for you not being holy. What am I saying to you? That you can go on sinning? By no means. I'm saying the Holy Spirit faithfully abides with you to help you get it right. John 4, 24. We must worship in the Spirit and He helps us to do so. Romans 8, 15. He convinces us of our sonship. Galatians 3, 5. He performs the miraculous through us. 
2 Corinthians 4, 13, he gives you faith. Acts 2, he gives you boldness. Romans 5, 5, he gives you a love for God and others. John 15, 26, he points to Jesus, glorifies Jesus, testifies of Jesus. Romans 8, 26, he prays for you and is your mighty intercessor. John 14, 15 through 18, he comforts you in times of heartache. John 16, 7 through 11, he's heaven's greatest evangelist. John 14, 12 and John 16, 7, the Holy Holy Spirit is the key, the secret to greater works. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. He was the same spirit who empowered Christ. My friend, he's the same Holy Spirit who hovered above the face of the deep and caused all things to come into existence. He was the same Holy Spirit who inspired the craftsmen that they might make those items for the tabernacle with excellence. He was the same Holy Spirit who interpreted dreams, who inspired psalms, who inspired the Proverbs, who moved the prophets of all to speak the oracles of God. He's the same Holy Spirit who rested upon the 12 disciples and the scripture says he dwells in you. Stop talking to me about demons. Talk to me about the power of the Holy Ghost. Greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. It's the presence of the Holy Ghost who abides in you. And my prayer tonight for those present and those watching is that you would come into an encounter with the Holy Spirit that would utterly transform you. You don't have to beg for it. In fact, even now it's begun. You sense that inspiration of the Spirit. That's what happens when the truth is preached. It liberates you. Spirit brings liberation. How many of you are ready for an encounter with the Holy Spirit? Now I want to be clear. In a few minutes... I will be praying for those who need healing and deliverance. But I'm talking to the believer who wants to be empowered afresh right now. Here's a simple altar call. I want you to stand right there where you're seated if you want that encounter. Don't look for an experience. Don't focus on a feeling. Don't overthink this. It's just Jesus. Hands lifted, eyes closed all across this room. I want you to forget about everything else happening around you. I don't want you to think about who's to your right or to your left. I don't want you to think about the situations you're facing. I don't want you to think about what you should or should not be doing to encounter God. Just let him do what he does. All I want you to think about is how much you love Jesus. Just begin to focus your mind and attention on him. And I want you for just a few minutes here, begin praying out loud in the Holy Spirit. Go. You online, do the same thing. And if you want that, I want you to type that in the comment section. Just type, I want that. Simple words. I want that. You don't need to beg, you don't need to scream, you don't need to plead. Just begin to receive. You watching online, same thing. You don't need to beg, you don't need to plead, you just need to receive. The touch of his presence, it's so simple, it's so simple, we complicate it. Just be like a child, expecting, expecting that touch of the Holy Spirit.
Spirit tells me that some of you as we worship are thinking about sins and mistakes that you think disqualify you from this moment. Just ask him to forgive you. Turn from that sin. He'll clean you. He won't reject you. He won't reject you. It's a lie from the enemy. Just begin to receive that blessed touch of the Holy Spirit's hand. Pray out loud in the Holy Spirit now. Many of you are coming into that encounter with his presence now. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we adore you. Conto Robobobo Centeriende Robobobaco. I'm even reading now the many different prayer requests coming in online. Jesus, we honor you, we glorify you. That's the beauty of his presence. Don't rush it, don't rush it, don't rush it. Hands lifted, eyes closed. Don't rush this moment. This is a moment now for you and him, you and him. Lift your hands and tell him. is make that your prayer. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place.
presence of the Holy Spirit here. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit here. Can you just begin to thank him now? Lift your hands. Just praise him. Just praise him. Praise him. Just praise him. He's a good God. You'll never be the same, brother. He's in a whole different place right now.
Pop them up, guys. A whole different place. I want you to say this loudly and boldly. Say, the Holy Spirit dwells in me. Say it again. The Holy Spirit dwells in me. One more time. Now give Jesus a hand of praise. You watching online, write that in the comment section. The Holy Spirit dwells in me. Take your seats just for a moment. Service is far from over here. You didn't wait in line for hours. Drive through that traffic. Some of you flew in. Some of you drove from far distances. You didn't come all this way to stop now. I see a people who are hungry for the things of God. That's perfect. Have them just play. I love you. I love you, my Lord, because I think it's appropriate right now. But when is it not appropriate to say you love them? But Matthew chapter 6. Go there now. Matthew 6. I'm going to read verses 24 through 33. This is Jesus speaking now. And he's talking about the fears that we have surrounding the area of our needs, our material needs. And as I said, in just a few minutes, we will be ministering to the sick and those who need deliverance. And I want you to just for a moment in your mind, separate the two things. The offering we take is separate from the healing and the deliverance. This is something that we do, that the work of the ministry might continue to be supported. As many of you know, there is no charge to be here tonight. We paid for the parking because we want to remove as many barriers as possible between the people and the Word of God. And so we're going to continue to freely give because we freely received. And we choose to base our ministry model on Scripture. And they say, what's your strategy for finances? I say one word, faith. That's the strategy. And God is always so faithful to inspire his generous people like you to give. Go there, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Pause. We read all throughout Scripture... One very clear portion of scripture puts it like this. The love of money is the root of all evil. Now, we understand that there are Old and New Testament characters who had considerable wealth. And their wealth wasn't necessarily the sin. Think of Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus never told him to give up his wealth. He was wealthy and he, of course, used his resources to help further and spread the message. I can summarize it like this. It's not a sin to have wealth as long as wealth doesn't have you. It's not a sin to have wealth as long as you don't put that wealth before Christ. It's not a sin to have wealth as long as you understand that the purpose of the gospel is not to get, get, get. The purpose of the gospel is to receive just one thing, the free gift of salvation through Christ alone. That's the gospel. But we do need to address what the scripture says about this side issue of money. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. And this is Jesus speaking. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Now I find this interesting because I had not noticed this before. The scripture says you can't serve God and money. You can't be enslaved to money and be a servant of God. Just not possible. And Jesus says, that is why I tell you. In other words, he is revealing to us the source of mammon. He is showing us how money gets a grip on our hearts. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. The most generous people I know are the most faith-filled in terms of the area of finances. The people who withhold are battling fear. And I can sympathize with that because I wasn't always a giver. 
I used to give excuses like, well, I'm an evangelist, so technically my income is the ministry. And Jess and I struggled for years financially. It wasn't until I recognized that as I give, I'm demonstrating to God that A, I'm a good steward of what he's placed in my hands, and B, I'm conquering fear. When you give, you're subjecting the flesh. Your flesh says, no, what about this, this, and that? Your flesh says, withhold, all the preacher wants is your money. The flesh says, withhold, they shouldn't be talking about that in church. And all the while, that spirit of generosity in you is fighting to get out. Faith, why do we withhold? You love the Lord, I know that. You love this ministry, I know that, and I appreciate that, and I feel the support. You love souls, I know that. I saw the way you reacted when the people here gave their lives to the Lord this, this past evening. So why don't we give sometimes? Well, it's because many of us battle this thing of fear. We listen to the news, and we listen to the social media stream. You know that every month there's a new thing to worry about? You know that every quarter the news cycle has something else to scare you? Every generation thought it was the generation that was the worst off financially. Every generation has its indicators of financial woe. But you know what every generation also has? People who prosper. The difference, faith and fear. That is why I tell you, Jesus says, not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. So seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. That's a promise. What is Jesus talking about here? He's talking about your material need. We can't ignore the fact that God created a material world where we have physical bodies and need to exist and experience things. And God doesn't overlook that fact either. He doesn't miss a thing. He's not shocked at the reality that we need to eat. He's not shocked at the reality that we need to sleep. He's not shocked that we need somewhere to live or clothes to wear. He sees all of that. And the scripture promises, just put the kingdom of God first. Put that kingdom first. And all of these things, they're going to be added right back to you. And live righteously, it says. So how do you put God first? One of the ways that you put God first is you give to ministries. See, when you give, you're going to write a check or you're going to give currency or you're going to give online and your finances are going to go into our ministry bank account and that ministry bank account is going to pay for things like airfare and this center and our beautiful worship team and, and, and all of the sound systems and the traveling and the, and the media and all of the ways that we reach the world. The gospel's free. The means to deliver it can get quite pricey, especially if you want to reach the masses. But you see, even though literally you are giving to a ministry and it's going into a ministry account where we'll do our best to maximize the efficiency of your gift, spiritually, when you give to the work of God, it's like you're putting resources in the hands of Jesus. So if Jesus were standing before you today, and you knew that what you put in his hand, he would use to further his kingdom, what would you give to him? You see how that changes the motive? If it's to get, to get, to get, we look at fear. But if it's because we love him, we're moved with that compassion. Jesus never held back from us. Don't hold back from him. 
So I'm going to ask those of you present here to help us cover the cost of this event. This event and events like it are in the six figures now. There are thousands that came here. We want to continue to be able to add thousands more. Even earlier this evening, they completely ran out of parking, which, which doesn't happen all that often. They were, I don't think they were ready for that. They heard church event. I don't think they were ready for that. They thought, oh, a church event, okay. You guys surprised them. But I want to continue to do this, and I want to continue to host these around the world and around the United States that souls might be saved and that believers might be empowered. And we do it, why? Because we love him. So I'm going to ask now that the ushers begin to pass around the offering envelopes. And if you can, please provide me with one so that I can instruct the people on how to use this envelope. I'll take one up here on the platform. Thank you, Britton. Be a good steward of what God has given you, and he can trust you with more. It's that simple. Be a good steward of what God has given you, and he can trust you with more. Where is Easton at? He's already raking his way down. By the way, guys, this is Easton Lawrence. He's a very talented, we'll call him a cinematographer. A very talented man here. Okay, so on the envelope, you'll notice there's this QR code. And that little code right there, you're going to scan that by taking your cell phone out, opening the camera app, and then hovering the camera lens over that QR code. A link will appear. You'll click that link, and then you'll use it to give. That's the easiest way to give. If you're writing a check, make it payable to David Hernandez Ministries. If you're giving by debit, use the QR code. If not, fill out the information. Um, as I often ask, please do not... I know we are charismatic and we believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but please do not write in tongues. Make sure it's legible and clear so that we can process your gift. Unless we have someone with the gift of tongues interpretation on the other end, and they'll ask for the Spirit's guidance in doing so. Um, make your checks, as I said, payable David Hernandez Ministries, not David Diga Hernandez, David Hernandez Ministries. It's going to go to the organization. And as you're preparing your gift, I'll just continue to share some of the things that our ministry is doing. I want to give you ample time to fill that out, and then we'll give ample time for the buckets to pass. You watching online, there's a massive crowd here. From the front to the back, this place is packed, and we're going to need some time to be able to pass this, so thank you for your patience as you're watching online. In the meantime, you can give by using the information on the screen, davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Uh, you can go give now. You'll have time to do that. Um, if you're watching this when this stream is live, You'll have just a couple of minutes, so there's plenty of time to go and give now and then come right back. If you're watching from around the world, we accept currencies from all different nations. If you're a Bitcoin trader, we actually have an option there that you can use to give Bitcoin. People have been asking us about it. I didn't even know it was that popular. People have been asking, do you accept Bitcoin? And yes, now we do, thanks to popular demand. And thank you for your support as you continue to give. And as I said, as you're continuing to fill that out, I'll just share with you just how the ministry functions and what we plan to do, um, we are a very, very simple ministry in that we have a very laser-focused agenda, and that is we want to spread the gospel of salvation, and we want to spread messages that help empower believers, and we do so through events and media. Very simple. The events are what you see here. The media, that's going to include live streams. That includes the teachings that you see, the short-form content that you see. Um, that we release regularly. We release two of those a day. Um, this, of course, also helps to go to support the infrastructure to make all of that possible. Bottom line is that we are about kingdom agenda and lives are being transformed. And I want to thank you for your giving. And in a moment, we will pray. Um, we're going to pass the buckets um, soon in just a bit. But uh, I'll give you some time to prepare that. I want to thank you while you're filling that out. And thank you online also for your giving it's, it's, it means so much to know that you support us. As I said, we step out in faith. These things cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm believing that every need will be met for our ministry and then some. I'm believing for over abundantly above even what we paid for this event so that we can do a bigger event here in California. So we want to we wanna see resources come in. All your giving goes to the general income of the ministry, of course. And we're just seeing God do things. We're getting requests from all over. I get messages every day, guys. Come to India. Come to Pakistan. Come to Nigeria. Come to Australia. Come to, come to um, New Zealand. I'm like, okay, I think, I, I think we'll put that one first. I've, I've always wanted to visit New Zealand. 
I'm just kidding. We go where the Spirit leads us. But, but no, we get requests from all over the place, and we want to go to all these nations. But we don't want to, we don't want to get ahead of where God is taking us. We want to make sure we're going at the pace of grace, as they say. So as the resources grow, we're also growing our ministry efforts. Let's go ahead and pass those buckets around. And as those buckets pass, I'm going to ask you to please uh, pay attention as that comes by. That'll help us to get these buckets to the crowds uh, more efficiently. Just watch for the bucket coming your way. Put your gift in and then pass it down. If you're still filling it out, you'll just let the bucket pass you. And then you can just go when you're done, find an usher uh, with one of the badges and give your gift to them if the bucket passed you without you being able to give. And we appreciate you working with our wonderful volunteers and staff. Um, I just want to thank all of these amazing volunteers out there. You see them just doing a tremendous job. Where's uh, Mr. Tim? Where's Tim? The, uh, the, the usher Tim, not the media guy Tim. Where's Tim? Uh, can, can you come here for a second, sir, if you don't mind? Just, yeah, yes, sir. Just, just he, he had no idea I was going to do this. I wasn't planning on it, but uh, look at, he's, he's, st- he's even working on his way up. I love that. I just want to say a little something here. You don't have to say any words, sir. I just, I just wanted the people to see you. And um, I want you to know we're grateful for you. Uh, I just want them to see who you are. Everybody, this is Tim. And <laughs> we, 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 don't, we don't get to uh, chat every time because you're so busy, I'm so busy. But I just wanted to thank you publicly in front of everybody. Because every event, this man has volunteered and helped us get everything. We couldn't do it without you. So I just want to thank you. <laughs> I kind of feel bad making him run all the way up here for that, but I, I'm sorry, sir, but I wanted them to see you. So we're so thankful for your giving, um, those resources. Pray that God would give us even more wisdom to maximizing the efficiency of that gift. You online, I want you to begin now to type in your prayer requests in the area of your finances. And you here, I want you to begin to ask the Lord to do something. Look. We have got to break this religious mindset that says, don't ask, don't ask, don't ask, don't ask. It's all about your motive and your heart when you ask. But you can ask him. I believe God wants to bless you to make you a giver that even more resources will go out into the kingdom of God. I believe that God wants to break the power of generational debt. I believe that God will give you the resources that you need to accomplish what he's given you to accomplish. What does the scripture say? The righteous leave an inheritance for their children. I believe that's talking about you. That's what the Bible says. And so in a moment, we're going to pray. And then after we pray for the offering, we're going to go into worship. And from the moment of worship, that's where we're going to begin believing for your healing and your deliverance. The moment is coming. The moment is coming. Just hold on. Just hold on. In fact, he may be even doing it now. He may even be bringing healing to you now. Not because of your giving, but just because he decided to do it now. Hands lifted, eyes closed. Father, I thank you for every giver here tonight. and Every giver watching online. And I pray, precious Lord, that you would pour out a blessing that they cannot contain. Lord, I thank you that your people give not to receive, but simply because they love you. And I pray, Lord, that you would prosper them. Prosper them even as their souls prosper. Give them increase and resources. Lord, I pray for unexpected income, unexpected resources to come in in the next couple of weeks. We ask that in Jesus' name. Lord, and we're asking not to consume it upon our own lusts. We're giving that we might become even greater givers. We honor and we bless you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And the church said, would you all stand to your feet? If the bucket has not passed you yet, just kind of be attentive until it does. The rest of you, lift your hands, close your eyes. I want you to begin now to just praise him. Don't wait for words. Don't wait for a song. Don't wait for a moment. Just begin to speak aloud those praises in your heart that are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Tell him what he means to you. Tell him how much you love him. 
Thank him for his grace. Thank him for his righteousness. Thank him for healing you. Thank him for delivering you. Thank him for saving your family. Thank him for liberating your mind. Just begin to lavish him now with the praises that come from the Spirit. Come on, people of God, lift your voices and praise him. He deserves it. He's worthy. We praise you, Lord. We praise you. lifted now as we sing I love you simple words Even now, the beauty of his presence manifests in this room. This is that moment for which you've longed. This is that touch for which you've prayed. We're not working toward it. We are in it. To see with the eyes of faith. And let the Holy Spirit lift your heart to heaven as the cares of the world begin to fade. The pressures of life begin to fade. All that 
that stands before you now is the glorious Lamb of God. And he's worthy. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our attention. Look to him now as we sing glory. his presence, church. Glory to Heavenly the One, Lord. Son of the living God, worship you. Glory Every voice lifted. Glory Sing from the depth of your spirit. Glory to Lift your hands now and see him seated in heavenly places. Jesus, we look to you now. Glorious one, great I am. Prince of Peace, Alpha and Omega. We turn our eyes to you. We turn our hearts to you. See him now, church. Seated at the right hand of the Father in power and glory. Eyes of fire. Piercing your very soul with the love of God. When he speaks, it's as the sound of many waters. 
lightning flashes before him. And through his hands you feel currents of power flowing. He's the very same Jesus who walked the shores of Galilee. He's the very same Jesus who opened the eyes of the blind. He's the very same Jesus who opened the ears of the deaf. He cleansed the leper. He healed the lame. He raised the dead. He delivered the captive. And he stands before you now. He's not rejecting you. He's accepting you. If you'll only reach back in faith now, only believe. All things are possible, only believe. All things are possible, only believe. Reach to him now, the healer, the deliverer, Jesus. And as you reach to him, join your voices with angelic choirs as we sing hallelujah.
you to do. First of all, how many of you just sensed the power of the Holy Ghost flow through this place? That was his power. Now, I want you in this moment now, by faith, to begin to test your body for that healing. If there was a problem in your knee, test your knee. If there was a tumor, I want you to look for that tumor. If you had skin disorder or skin disease, I want you to check the skin. If there was a problem with your eyes, check your eyes. With your ears, check your ears, and so forth. And as you exercise your faith to check right now, if you have to step out in the aisle to do it, feel free, my friend. You online, do exactly the same. And if you're watching online and you believe God just healed you, I want you to write that in the comment section right now. How many of you here tonight believe you've been healed? Just wave at me. Look around the room, guys. Now, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. And it may make you a little nervous, but that's okay. The things that make us nervous are good and they stretch us in many instances. If you believe you've been healed tonight, I want you to share that testimony with the world. Now, you're not going to lose your healing just because you didn't testify. Me from a few years ago would have said that because that's what I'd been taught, but it's not in the Bible, so it's not true. But what will happen if you do testify is that people will be inspired by your miracle. And somebody watching is going to see your healing, and they're going to say within themselves, I can receive a miracle too. So if you believe you've been healed, I want you to step out of your seat right now and come and stand right over here where these gentlemen are waving you down. Let's give them a hand as they come from all over. Look at what the Lord has done. Look at what the Lord has done. This is Jesus. This is not the touch of man. This is not the work of man. Only Jesus can do this. Only Jesus can do this. Look at all these miracles, church. Can we give the Lord a mighty hand of praise? The rest of you, you may be seated. And again, if you're watching online and you've been healed in your body, I want you to write that in the comments section, whether you're watching live or on the replay. And in fact, if you commented on the live, I want you to come back and also comment it on the replay so that people can continue to see it long after the live stream has been finished. Still, they're coming from all around the world, the, the room. Well, they came from all around the world and now they're in the room and now they're coming from all around the room. Look at this line of people right here, guys. This is so inspiring to see. I'm overwhelmed. Only Jesus can do this. You, you, you want to know something. You, you see the crowds. You see the live streams. And some, maybe there's a fellow minister who's believing for breakthrough in their ministry. They're saying, what did you do? I'm telling you right now, I haven't the slightest idea. All I know is when you obey God, all things are possible. So don't compare. I really sense strongly that's for someone watching. There's a minister watching right now. And in their heart, they're inspired by what they're seeing. And they're wondering, Lord, how do I be used by that? I'm telling you, just follow Jesus. Just love him and keep it simple. And remember to give him all the glory. The moment I start taking credit for what he does, the moment I think that these people are coming here for me, he's done with me. And he'll set me aside until I can grow out of that. So just keep your eyes on Jesus. Preach the true gospel, and there's no telling where God will take that. Mr. Mays, what happened here? David, this is Winston. He said for 16 years he's been dealing with shoulder pain. He said he's expected he needs to get replacements in his shoulders. And he said that during the prayer, he felt it pop. And he said that now he has more mobility, and he believes the Lord has healed him tonight. Can you show me? Yes, my right shoulder, as I was worshiping, worshiping the Lord, I felt it pop about three times. So I believe the Lord gave me a new replacement, a brand new creative miracle. So was it just the pop that you felt? I felt three pops. As I was worshiping, I felt a pop, pop, and another pop. And no one was like moving your arm around or nothing? My arm, it was as I was worshiping, I just started focusing and looking at Jesus worshiping him and he healed me well can we give the lord a hand of praise for that how bad was the pain it was very bad 
Really? Scale of one to ten, where would you put it? About a ten. Probably about a ten. I believe the Lord is going to continue to do that healing and use that healing for me to minister to people. In Jesus' name. And 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 when you were living with this pain, what were some of the things that prevented you from doing? I could do, there's a lot of things I couldn't do. I couldn't do heavy lifting or any of that, but I just constant pain all the time. The doctors wanted to do complete shoulder replacements. But I flew here from Alabama believing that God was going to do a miracle. And how long had you suffered with that? For 16 years. 16 years. Lord, we're believing for full restoration. Whoa. May it never return again. In Jesus' name, Lord, we release. Stretch your hands toward him. Just say fire. Thank you, Jesus. Now, some of you might be wondering what this is. Signs, miracles, and wonders. Signs point and give direction. Miracles solve a big problem. And wonders just make you wonder. <laughs> it, I can't explain it to you. It began happening when I was about 13 years old when I first started preaching. I would minister and pray for the people, and I would, I, they would collapse. And at first I thought, okay, am I going to get in trouble for this? What is happening? And nobody told them to do that. Nobody coached them how to. It just started happening. And the Lord told me, it's the overflow. It's the overflow from my presence. And so that's all I know, is that, that, that when the Holy Spirit really grabbed hold of my life, this just started happening. I have no further explanation. Help them up. Now you go back to your doctor, have them check you, and we want that report in Jesus' name. You go rejoicing in your healing. And guys, do watch the ledge here. We're a little close to it. What happened here, Sergio? Diga, this is Linda. Last week, she had a fractured knee due to tendonitis. And she said there was a crystal in the knee, which caused a uh, circulation to, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm nervous. She had tendonitis. You guys all love Sergio? We love you, man. We're rejoicing with you. What, what happened? So she came in with a brace. She couldn't bend her knee because her knee was fractured. She said she felt warmth come over that knee. She can bend the knee. She's supposed to see the specialist, but she believes she's healed. I have the back brace and I have the knee brace in my hand. I felt like chills all over my body. I was here yesterday and I walked in with my cousin with a brace and I said, you know what? When you said hold the, the part of your of your body that you want healing, I just held my knee and I felt the Holy Spirit, but you know, I was still in pain. And even my husband got mad at me because he's all like, you're going to go like that. You know, you're not in such a big pain. If you're going to go, I'm all like, you know what? Nothing is going to stop me. I said, I'm going to go and I'm going to go and... I was supposed to come today alone, but my son came with me and I said, you know what? I'm going to get healed today. I have to, an appointment to see the specialist on Thursday, but I am, look at my knee. <laughs> and you said your, your son is here? Where is your son? How, what's his name? Jonathan. Jonathan, come here for a second, please. Use a, use a, yeah, use these stairs right here. Come on up here, Jonathan. How old is Jonathan? Gonna be 15? Jonathan, I gotta ask you, what do you think of what you're seeing here right now? What do you think of this? This is, amen. <laughs> <laughs> and how was it watching her in pain all that time? How long was it for? A week. It was a week. How, what was it like seeing her in pain? Well, you know, I just felt sad not being able to help my mom. But with God, that's the only reason she got better. You know, Jesus did this. And you know, he wants to heal your heart. 
He wants to heal your heart, Jonathan. He wants to heal your heart and he wants to use your life. Look at me. I know you felt rejected. But God is accepting you. And there's a call on your life. And he wanted you to see what he could do for your mom today. And you're never going to be the same after today. What you're feeling right now, that's the love and the power of God. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit. What do you think of that? Amen. <laughs> He's going to use you. Do you want that? Yes, sir. Lift your hands. Close your eyes. Stretch your hands toward him, guys. Father, I love this. He doesn't even know what to do. That's how you know he's genuine. I like, I like people who don't play church. They're just real. Lord, touch Jonathan's life. Let him never be the same again. Stretch your hands toward him, guys. Don't worry. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Help him up for a second. What did you feel happen to you right now? Well, I just felt nervous. And what? But what did you feel come on you? I felt like a gust of wind go through my body. You ever felt anything like that? No. Guys, it's the real deal here tonight. The power of the Holy Ghost is here. Both you guys go rejoicing, go see your doctor, have them check you, and then we want that report, and to Jesus belongs the glory. What happened here, Britton? David, I have Jesse here. He said in April, five months ago, he was riding his e-bike to work and got hit by a car. I'm sorry, he was riding his... E-bike. E-bike, okay, like an electronic to bike. To work, okay. and he got hit by a car. He said his knees have been in tremendous pain. He's been seeing specialists, going to therapy, trying to get his knees back. He's had constant inflammation, constant pain. He said that during the worship in the prayer, he felt the power of the Holy Spirit come upon him, a warmth go through him, and he said the pain is completely gone. just so glad for him church you go rejoicing brother what happened here Sergio Diga this is Val since she was 18 months old she had a cricket left eye wait 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 say that again her left eye was cricket since she was 18 months old 18 months old she had blurry eyes she needed glasses to see properly she said she felt a cold wind come over her eye and she opened up her Bible by faith to read the words. Everything was clear and she even told her friend, is my eye straight? They said it's straight and she said she can see clearly now.
the presence of the Lord is here. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. You are holy. Holy. Are you Lord God Almighty? Worthy is the Lamb. close the stream I want to pray for you and I believe that the same power that's present here in this moment right now touching these people all over the room can touch you right where you are in your home in that hospital bed at that workplace at that school in that car the power of the Holy Ghost can touch your life so father in the name of Jesus we pray for supernatural transfer let the anointing that's present here come upon every single one of those watching this Lord I pray that even the skeptics watching this would receive a portion of the spirit that's here. Lord, I pray that even those who would criticize this would receive a portion of that which is here. And the church said, God bless those of you watching online. And until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God.